You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and welcome to episode maybe 199, maybe 201. It's going to depend. Uh, yeah, we have, <laughs> have a potential scheduling thing that we may want to push in front of this one. So if yeah. it's 201, you've already heard that. If yes. it's 199, it's coming in two weeks. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Uh, this is a very special episode because it's a long requested episode yes. by some of our Canadian listener, listeners as they wanted to hear more about what's going on in their country. So, uh, so I've do I. Reached out to some or someone I knew, uh, Melissa Spearing, and then she said, "Well, you know what? Can we have have another guy come on too?" So it was uh, Doctor Stefan Weber is joining us as well, and um, and you're both in Canada, right? I don't know how we can confirm that audio, through audio. It's like, oh, do you point the Camera out your window and <laughs> to see what plants are outside. But if, um, if someone if someone Google's Bethany Ontario, that's where I'm sitting. Bethany right Ontario. Now. All right. So no, and we're really we're really glad to have you because, uh, like I mentioned, we've been getting some requests on uh, from some of our Canadian listeners saying, "Hey, I'd love to hear more about how native plants are, are uh, what the reaction to native plants are, what some uh, organizations are doing with native plants in my country." So. This was our opportunity to kind of venture into that realm of uh, of the north to us. So before we get into too much, would you guys mind kind of giving yourselves a little bit of an introduction on who you are, where you work, and and um, and your involvement with native plants in some way? Melissa, why don't we start with you? Sure. Yeah, and great, great to be here, and hello to all the Canadians and Americans listening. Um we don't have a lot of snow yet, but we're getting more soon. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I grew up in Southern Ontario and uh, currently I'm working with the Canadian Forest Service. So there's uh, six regional offices across the U.S., very a canon similar to what the U.S. Forest Service does. We have a national tree seed bank um, and facility out in Fredericton, New Brunswick. So that's where I work the majority of the time. And uh, I'm also doing a lot of work with the Canadian Forest Genetics Association and uh, a lot of work with forest industry, restoration, reclamation. Um, my background has been in native plant production um, for my parents had a little, well, I won't say it's little, it's a very impressive <laughs> medium-sized nursery in Southern <laughs> Ontario. And um, yeah, I really did uh, got my love for plants from there. And I was really lucky and fortunate to go um, train at the Millennium Seed Bank in England for a long time and took school down with the Niagara Park School of Horticulture. So I've been infused with native plants and, well, plant propagation my whole life. So whether I liked it or not, now I really like it. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah. Stefan, how about you? Hi there. Yeah, it's good to be on your podcast. I am a botanist and restoration biologist. I'm currently working with the Canadian Wildlife Federation on a national seed strategy framework inspired very much by the seed strategy that you folks have in the United States. Um, although most of my previous work is in applied restoration ecology, I worked for Canada's largest native seed supplier uh, for about eight years and um, otherwise have a background in community ecology, evolutionary biology, and uh, I really, really love plants. Very cool. Very cool. So what we were curious just to start, and I know this is such a broad question, and and it's I, I guess I, I don't even know what to expect from the answer is, but just as far as native plants um, as a movement, what is the culture right now in Canada kind of considering native plants? Is it um, you know I, I we know here in the states, especially in the Northeast, the amount of damage that has been done, the amount of restoration work, um, and the amount of invasives have taken over and, and how it's increasingly becoming a bigger issue every year and and native native plants becomes a bigger buzzword every year. I wasn't sure, and I'm sure it varies in parts of Canada as well, same here in the U.S., but just the overall feel towards native plants. Yeah, um, I'll start off there. 
I would say there's a lot of excitement and a lot of interest across Canada for a wide variety of reasons in native plants. I think people are increasingly starting to understand um, that native plants are the foundation of all of our ecosystems as well of, as well as our economies. Um, there's certainly you know a big push to garden with native plants for pollinators and birds and stuff like that. Um, but there's also increasing recognition that native plants are essential in meeting our sustainability goals. Um, you know, native plants are the only nature-based climate solution that I can think of. And right now, at least federally, the government's really focused on climate change and, and carbon sequestration. And so there's a lot of interest in looking to native plants to do that. Native plants are also obviously very important to indigenous peoples. Uh, and, you know, restoration of native plants is part of a much broader cultural resurgence, I'd say, in, in Canada. However, I think there's a lot of areas that, um, you know, native plants are still being ignored. There's a certain amount of plant blindness within policymakers, you know, um, even within the general public don't fully understand what plants, let alone native plants, do for us. So although there's increasing passionate interest in native plants, I think there's still a lot of room to grow up here. I, I, I can imagine, and like anything else, it varies right before we started the podcast. I, I had spoken to someone at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and they said that they had a project going on right in our backyard, and they had a, it was all going to be native plants. And they just sent me the plant list I was looking at before we came in. I'm like, there's no native plants on here. <laughs> like there's three out of like a plant list of like 150 species. And I was just like, I wonder what they're – what they considered – to be a native plant because none of these are, are are native. And it wasn't even just cultivars. It was just things that were flat out not not native to here. But mm-hmm. um, we, we see that confusion all the time just within our industry, with within government. Every state has yeah. their – our, our state is one of the few that still doesn't have invasive species legislation. Um, we're, we're one of the last ones, but it's it just got vetoed, but it's it should be reworked and passed. Mm-hmm. So it's – it's just interesting to hear perspectives that, you know, just like anywhere else, there's, you know, it gets overlooked sometimes <laughs> as, as far as importance goes. Yeah, and I can um, add to what Stefan was saying. I mean, um, you know, I, I consider Stefan right now the expert on, on a lot of a lot of the elements that probably are getting, um, you know, most ignored, I would say, um, because forestry in Canada is, is I'd say pretty robust and it's been around for a long time. And I just did a, a, a big study over four years to sort of try to do kind of what the, uh, the national academies was doing. And again, I, I got to meet, meet Tom down in the 2017 native plant conference and it was really inspiring. Um, so I was glad I got sort of that first push. And then in 2019 or so I got roped into doing sort of a, an assessment across Canada of what, uh, yeah, sort of preparing for the next 10 years, trying to imagine how trees and shrubs and all the other native plants and seed suppliers um, are going to fit into this and help meet it because we don't have very many producers in Canada. And, um, but, you know, forestry has always been a big thing for us. We produce and plant like 500 or 600 million seedlings a year. And I think the context that I always get um, from all the traveling I've been able to lucky to do with seed now since that, that Millennium Seed Bank course and just the U.S. conference was one of them. Um, you know, just like the impression that I get overall of what the native plant movement looks like is that, you know, the U.S. is, is really well spread out. And from one of the big differences that I think maybe the American listeners could could hear is that, you know, um, in Canada, our provinces and territories, the equivalents of the states, like they have much more responsibility over public land policy and, and use and uh, particularly in sustainable forest management, there was a really big shift um, like through the, the 90s and, and making sure that the, the jurisdictional boundaries for the, the provinces were responsible for a lot of a lot of that land and including even mining and reclamation. A lot of those policies don't land on the federal government. You know, we don't have direct control, perhaps, say, the way the BLM does. Um, so we have, I think, uh, eight, I'm not trying to remember the numbers, don't quote me perfectly on this, but um, I think it's, you know, more than 85% of the land in Canada is managed by subnational governments. Um, and the government, the federal government, um, actually it only manages a, a pretty small percentage. So um, the native plant movement is really hinging on a lot of, of, of 
it's hinging on a lot of different agencies and a lot of cooperation that we need to do. And then, you know, you guys have a lot of suppliers. I'm so impressed all the time and tell people all the time, go look at the eco-regional revegetation tool. And mm -hmm. I love Andrea Kramer's work um, in terms of what she's been able to do, but, you know, to have 800 or 900 or I'm not sure 1200 native plant suppliers that you guys have in the States. Now, you know, we might be lucky to have, uh, you know, two or 300 people that deal with native plants, but primary producers, there might only be a hundred. Mm -hmm. And of those that produce wow. massive quantities and massive diversity, it's probably even less for seed collectors. I've really tried to figure out who's, you know, kind of who's a professional. I do it again when it's hard and hot outside kind of person. And I mean, <laughs> I kind of think with forestry people included, you might be somewhere up around three or 400 seed collectors in Canada in total, but it's super seasonal. We have mm -hmm. Well, long winter most years. Um, so the native plant movement, you know, it's truncated, it's short. We're geographically squished against the border. The primary places where native plants are produced are like BC, Alberta, Southern Ontario, Quebec. Um, and again, from my perspective, I think we have a really good system and we have like a hundred years of history doing tree breeding, but you know, it's really hinging on our, our bread and butter pines, spruces, fir are really well looked after. And then, you know, there's, in forestry, at least, there's a lot more um, push for and need for uh, deciduous trees. There's this changing of system migration policies. You know, we don't have a lot of seed orchards um, of woody plants that are, again, those workhorse species that we need right now um, from from genotypes that scientists are telling us we need to go into the state to get. So there's a lot of uh, change around that that's been happening in the last, you know, I'd say it's really been building since probably 2010. Um, and I mean, I kind of, I kind of had a good quote when I was thinking yesterday, I said, you know, like the, my answer to this question is what does the state, the native plant movement look like? I just call it kind of a diffuse problem. Canada's got low population, lots of wild spaces. Seed is out there, but it's like just never anywhere when you need it on mass. Um, so yeah, I would agree with everything that Stefan said and just, you know, I'll, I'll kind of maybe represent the woody plant and forestry side of things because mm -hmm. it is well-regulated. There are requirements for people to replant um, after harvest and, and, and on the vast majority of land in Canada. So our deforestation rates are low, but we have the same problems that you guys are facing in the West, which is like wildfires and droughts becoming a problem and species, you know, near natives are becoming a, a big topic as well. So I'm paying attention to all of it. <laughs> but yeah, the other thing that I'm really excited about is just this new recognition in the last few years for Indigenous food sovereignty, Indigenous, indigenous mm -hmm. protection and conserved areas like actually in the words of there's a really great document called pathway to target one which was the prior to the montreal um biodiversity meeting targets like there's a really great line in there it's the only document i know of where it's like we want to build a seed conservation economy mm -hmm. and it's for indigenous it's to it's to towards what they want to do with protected lands and and to reinstate a lot of the traditional um and new harvesting rights that they want to want to do so that's wonderful. I'm excited about that. And we have a, we have a new program that we launched in March, 2022, um, through the Canadian forest service for the indigenous seed collection program. So I'm, uh, yeah, it's been a very active thing in the last few years, but I can talk about that later, but it, I think the native plant movement looks fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It, it, it reminded me what you were saying kind of of our industry here, maybe 15 years ago, because I think where we're at, it's a little more densely populated, but I, you know, in the last fifteen years, our competition's probably tripled, and it's still not enough to meet the demand at this point. But you know, it wasn't as profitable as a business back then because it was almost all restoration projects. It, people didn't want them for their properties. <laughs> it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a buzzword in garden centers. It was more if the if the government jobs existed, you could sell plants, and it was still hit or miss. You know, the Clean Water Act. Uh, work towards that a lot of the local regulations but you know in our part of the country there's a lot more native plant nurseries there it's some parts of the country there's very little because it's very hard to collect seed it's very hard to do a lot of these things so it's mm -hmm. i'm sure those numbers are concentrated in certain hot spots here but it sounds like what you were explaining is where we were at 15 years ago <laughs> mm -hmm. do you do you see where there could be more nursery sprouting up like in the future based on the conversations that are happening and where everything's going legislatively. Um, absolutely. I, I would say that, uh, 
I would say that a lot of what is happening now and when I see different federal government programs um, or municipal or subnational, I mean, I, I would call it less legis legislative or more carrots. Um, there's been a lot of funding and grants and contributions and programs that are through one way or another facilitating greenhouse, like small greenhouses to start up capacity building, um, you know, research and development um, streams. I was really fortunate to take part in helping um, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. They have a new boreal research plant and seed technology, um, uh, like kind of like a training technical access center. So it's kind of what your native plant material development farms are kind of like. Um, so, you know, industry groups can go there and, and get research and development um, done in partnership with them. So, you know, there's, there's those things spreading up. Um, legislation and policy here takes, takes longer to change. So I would say that there's nothing forcing anybody to grow more native plants um, <laughs> that I know of. And, and I just think that uh, uh, some things will happen naturally, I think just because of the groundswell of support for this yeah. and the recognition again at national and international levels that the co-benefits are a lot bigger than, than just, you know, jobs and funding. I guess as a companion question to like, what's the native plant move, movement like? Like, what's the state of your natural lands? Like, I and, and you mentioned a couple things that that kind of struck a chord with me because for me, I I think of Canada as the the great wilderness, you know. And it's you know, I'm curious, like, what are the states of your your natural land? What are some of the the factors that contribute to the areas that aren't good um, or um, you know, we're always looking at like loss of prairie habitat, loss of uh, biodiversity with birds and insects and pollinators and monarchs and things like that. So, what are some of what what do you what would you say the current state of your natural lands is? With some of the biggest impacts that remediation would be, like you mentioned, mines. You mentioned timber. I would imagine those are some of the things that that factor in there. But I I, I feel a little ignorant. I don't know the answers to those. I feel like Stefan and Will have good insight on this. All right. Sure, I can jump in. Um, yeah, there's a lot of natural resource extraction that devastates the landscape, and there's seed-based restoration required for that, whether it's timber, uh, oil, and gas. Um, but I would say the impact, the legacy of colonial agricultural systems on the southern portions of Canada, particularly the southwest of Ontario, the southern prairie, southern B.C., um, so these are the most biologically rich parts of Canada. They're also the densest, most densely populated. And so the odds of, or whatever, the, the needs of plants are at odds with the needs of people. And I think just that loss of habitat because of, you can call it urban sprawl, industrial sprawl, um, the industrialization of the landscape. And I should also probably mention climate change itself, um, you know, because we're, a northern country climate change in a lot of ways impacts us greater um and so some of those arctic and subarctic regions i i i think we're just starting to understand uh what those areas will need into the future in terms of restoration rehabilitation and kind of what, what losses we're facing there um base of species you know uh we we've got a lot of whether they're other plants or whether they are pathogens, pests that are impacting our forests, um, I think that's pretty devastating as well. Hey, one thing I wanted to add, kind of the that whole um, the idea of the native plant movement in uh, well across all North America, but in Canada, is how have you seen differences working with colleagues from province to province? Are there some provinces that you feel are are uh, What's the right word? Progressive. I don't, I don't want to say progressive, but um, further along in the process. I'm looking at where we are in the, the U.S., and it seems like the coasts are ahead of the interior of the country. And I think they worry about climate change probably the most being surrounded by oceans. <laughs> yeah, and that's not <laughs> and, to say the interior of the country isn't doing it as well, yeah. but there's hot spots and then there's cooler spots. Do you find that to be the same case uh, across Canada? I'd say so. I'd say it's more of a south-north uh, gradient. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I should also say that some regions, 
like Alberta, for example, that have a lot of natural resource extraction, they also have some of the most robust native plant and restoration policies precisely because they need to revegetate so much land. Um, and so Alberta really sticks out as a shining example of what a native plant economy could look like. On the other hand, on the other hand, you have southwestern Ontario, which also has a very robust native plant economy, but this is largely driven by private landowners, biodiversity conservation efforts, and less about you know reclamation of of degraded landscape landscapes. Um, and then you look to the far north, you know, the Yukon Northwest Territories, and you look to the east. There's nothing there. There's virtually there may be mm-hmm. one or two native plant producers in in the entire you know Atlantic Canada. Um, that pr- provide native plant seeds. So, yeah. and and Melissa, I see you laughing, and I think that's because you grew or you grew up and you live uh, some of the time in like Ontario, and then but a lot of your work is more in the is that the maritime area yeah. where yeah. you work, right? Yeah, they, they, the the Atlantic and maritime provinces are like New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PI, and. Sometimes Newfoundland, I don't know the exact definition. Sometimes Newfoundland and Labrador are included, sometimes they aren't. Um, I I would, yeah, I agree well with a lot of what the fan says, obviously. I'm laughing only because, um, you know, I, I I think the the difficult the difficulty that we face, and it's, and it's just the, you know, apples to oranges comparison with the U.S. and seeing how progressive your U.S. native plant movement has been and the strategy and, the, you know, I'm, I'm going to say that right now recorded, live and i said it last week at the plant conference like peggy oil is my hero um but you know i think that the apples and oranges comparison for me is that that i i wouldn't call any of our provinces or or um, territories or any you know organization in canada as more progressive or not it's just what capacity people had and how much um you know how much energy and support do the people who are the boots on the ground people get and the industries that have developed in the past from, yeah, resource extraction, from the need to grow food for, you know, Canada does have a history of that we're trying to reconcile with Indigenous peoples. Um, you know, all of that simply just adds up to what one of my colleagues calls, we just have, have, have and have not regions. And it's waxed and waned, and it has actually nothing to do with politics or anything to do with um, government investment per se, it has to do really just with the amount of people and the amount of activity mm-hmm. in an area and the the collective stewardship feeling that the groups that are on the ground have towards making sure those resources are available for, for future people. So um, I think that's my part, take on it that, you know, <laughs> I'm just laughing also too, because, you know, there is a lot of new people that are getting funding now through a couple of really big programs that were announced a couple of years ago. Um, the two billion tree program is one. Uh, there's another. I'm trying to remember the other ones, and I apologize, I can't at the very moment. But there's a, a bunch of funding streams that are enabling um, a lot of biodiversity work, which will naturally wrap up and, and net some native plant interests and, and help people do these things. So there are new native plant producers popping up all over. It's just we don't have some of the size, uh, you know, and the people that are registering large businesses all of a sudden. Um, and I would say that, you know, what is well represented across Canada's reforestation mm-hmm. nurseries um, because they service every province and almost every region where there's timber supply to be had. And they've, they've been there operating on a, I, I've looked at some statistics and it was really good to compare with what the academies of sciences were doing. And I mean, reforestation nurseries are from what I can tell, from our stats Canada numbers more profitable than, than just purely <laughs> where most native plant producers right now will fit into like ornamental horticulture, horticulture yeah. um, when it comes to that. So reforestation nurseries have, have done, um, have done a lot and have, again, there's been nurseries either provincially or private in Canada since the thirties or so for actually the twenties. So, um, yeah, I would say that, that, uh, while there's threats, there has been a bit of a, a machine going that we can build on and that people are probably interested in, in, in building up from. So I think, awesome. I think in this, like for us, I feel it, it definitely varies state to state or different parts of the country mm-hmm. um, because you do still have a faction of like climate change deniers <laughs> and, and policy uh, regarded to that. There's, you know, there's, there's some states that aren't, 
as receptive to native plants, we had one of our listeners telling us about, you know, where they're like, we, that the state that they're in, some of the programs are like, we don't discriminate against plants. So whether it's native or non-native, we don't turn any of them away, you know, which, which can make it, you know, and we're not into shaming non-native plants either, but there, there's definitely some obstacles and, and different views. I think what changed for us, you know, and I mentioned before, like the Clean Water Act, some of the regulations here in the Pine Barrens definitely helped jumpstart this nursery because if the government requires it, it creates an opportunity uh, for for someone to grow those plants. But I think that the big change for us came with, with Dr. Doug Tallamy and his, his books um, – Breeding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kilmer, and then just social media. The amount of native, like native plant talk, uh, Kyle Leibarger exploding with how to kill a habitat by planting lawns, just kind of created an awareness that I we would have never have, have achieved twenty years ago. I think, mm-hmm. but well, it, and I think. I, oh, sorry. No, I'm I'm done. I'm sorry. I, I think just going back to build though to the question about sort of like threats and, and issues though I'm like you know I a lot of people probably get the picture that yeah it's a big giant wilderness and there's you know, I don't know what the numbers are three people per square kilometer or something silly like that but um, the fact of the matter is too those that it is a very there's a very strong gradient from where we have lots of habitat and I experience this every single time I drive from Toronto area like if you drive from I don't know say Niagara Falls. Ontario and you drive up around the GTA and then you drive up to St. Lawrence and then you drive down through New Brunswick and in Nova Scotia. You want a great little drive to experience what, uh, you know, the range of Canadian, uh, you know, clearing and, and settlement looks like it. That's a very good drive to do um, because it really just covers the gamut of, of, you know, right from almost untouched perfect old mm-hmm. growth forest. If you're down funny national park to, to, you know, the urban core. Um, and so, yeah, there is this massive, massive gradient of, of needs and what native plants can do to address them. So, yeah, I, I mean, I work on everything from white spruce, which is, I mean, it's the most planted tree in, in Canada, I think, right now, um, you know, right down to, like, the rarest thing that we have where there's, I, you know, there's one Murray's birch left, apparently, in all of Canada, and wow. and we have seed from it. So, you know, I'm interested in all of it because you can't repaint the picture. You can't repaint any picture if you're missing half the colors is basically what I get told all the time. <laughs> and I get very sad about things like ash, like ash. I'm actually wearing ash earrings right now and they were formed from real seeds that I helped pick. Um, you know, like I get sad about ash cause that really got me involved in seed conservation in Canada. And I was running around before EAB got to black ash swamps and, Everyone thought I was crazy knocking on doors. Like, can I go in your swamp, please? Like, please let me in. People are like, why do you care about this? I'm like, because it might not, there may not be another seed here for like 10 years. I should, I should get it now and put these babies away for a while. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, there's a real need to be more proactive before more is lost, before things get lifted. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't do, we can't recover things and we can't, um, and can't grow an economy if we don't have, have the, have the palate so yeah that's what it, i get get excited about this is a complete aside but we were having a, a business conversation earlier about um we're gonna switch uh email providers and there's one option on the table where you can just get the switch the email and it's like there's some backups involved or you can get like a third party backup to it and uh my thing is like eh, we don't need the backup where there's like what, what, what are the chances that something bad happens? But then here you are, you are the backup in a sense, of, or for some of the stuff. It's like, hey, this we know there's threats out there. This is something that is at risk, and if we don't have these seeds, in that case, they might not be there. They could be, and it could, everything could be fine. But there's a chance that they aren't, and it's good to have that security. Oh. And we've been through that loss here. Oh. We've lost uh, American chestnuts. You know, mm-hmm. we've seen the devastation to American elm, and we just keep losing things that are good mass producers. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you you think, oh well, it couldn't happen again. <laughs> and then you get Asian mm-hmm. longhorn beetle. You get emerald ash borer. Um, what would you consider? What are some of the biggest threats to natural areas or native plants in Canada right now? Like you mentioned, emerald ash borer. Um, I guess it depends on the province and, and the makeup of the natural lands. But what are some of the biggest biggest threats to 
to uh, your 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 natural lands and native plants? Uh, I'll, I'll start with a super brief thing because I know Stefan's got lots on this too. But um, yeah, I, even last summer I just thought of it because it, it just the news just kept hitting like June, July, August. It was just like we found oak wilt. We've got you know uh, hem, hemlock woolly adelgid spreading. Uh, there's this you know that new rampant beech leaf disease. There's just there's just all these things. And I think the biggest thing that I deal with in my job is is just trying to anticipate new pathogens coming that are, you know, at risk of killing 90% of something. And there's no amount of legislation or, or protection you can do at that point for some of those things. It's just they're, they're one of those sad ecological windshield wiper blades that just goes through and it's like whoosh. And, you know, I, I got like actually emotional because I went and found a couple of pumpkin ash, like the two pumpkin ash and seed. Um, you know, just before they got recognized as endangered recently. And, you know, I was just so thrilled and happy, but that's not, that's, I wish I was there 25 years prior. So, you know, I, the biggest threat is, to me is not having a time machine to go backwards in time and, and do some of these things beforehand. But um, yeah, for, for what I do, forest health uh, and pests and pathogens that are coming up from the States that are spotted lantern flies on the doorstep. I mean, I pay attention naturalist all the time just to see what port something might arrive in soon and try and get ahead of people but yeah for me that's 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 my big thing when when you mentioned beach i mean that's one of the things to us that's so devastating like i at least i've heard a couple things recently about emerald ash borer that they, there's some things in the works that may happen within 10 years that some of the plants that are too small to be attacked by the time they're big enough in 10 years that maybe we might have, you know, there might be light at the end of the tunnel. But with the beach leaf disease, I'm not hearing anything positive. <laughs> Just that we're going to lose all the beach. The uh, the the one great thing that's coming along, and it's really kind of on my bucket list to go to go visit them. But I mean, you know, the U.S. Forest Service has phenomenal disease resistance breeding programs, and Richard Schnenko out in the West, and Jennifer Koch in the East, and Holden Arboretum getting involved, like. Those kinds of programs are so important to to work for us to work with, for us to pay attention to the early research, um, and for us to also communicate and talk about how effective it is sometimes. So the only like the thing that's effective to us to 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 try and be proactive again is to try and communicate with people and and find out if people see survivors and see resistance or see potential trees early on whether or not it's been before or after the disease front. So like, we're always trying to reach out the same way the U S forest service does to, to ask people, like, if you see something, let us know, you know, we'll put it on a map, we'll flag it. We'll, we'll, we'll go out and test it sooner or later. Seed or seed or, or DNA. We've got researchers that do those kinds of things. I find lots of times people, this is just a general comment. Like people get really negative about the, what's coming but like my boss had said before i'm like we can do something about this use your eyes and use the hotlines and call us like that's that's something anybody can do you can be a professional forester or just you know grandma saw a a good looking beach call me (laughs) (laughs) which is important i I, i'm not going to say names i have i've never talked about this on the podcast but tom knows probably what i'm about to bring up but I, I had the opportunity to have a, a cordial discussion with with the owner of a, a large nursery, like very large nursery. And at, it was after touring their labs, which was used to create genetic mutations and plants for new cultivars and varieties and everything. And a lot of people were very excited and I was very depressed. <laughs> and they're like, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, but just think if this amount of money was – used to save what we already have rather than create mm-hmm. something that doesn't exist like if you were to use this technology could would we have american chestnut would we have all these other things that we've lost and that's what was said so it sparked this whole conversation it was a very gracious conversation but i don't know that <laughs> that that changes that changes anything but sorry didn't mean to sidetrack everyone uh stefan do you want to uh stefan do you want to uh chime in on this um sure i mean i think you've touched on the big ones climate change invasive species that kind of stuff i i do want to maybe just reiterate the role of land use planning and policy around land use planning particularly in the south southern parts of canada particularly around grassland habitats 
um, where we've centered our urban areas and our farms and stuff, because a lot of these plants in their communities, they just exist as tiny little remnants on the landscape, and they're not protected in any way, shape, or form. And that's where all the you know seed that we need for restoration is derived from, ultimately. So we don't even have native plant producers in a lot of region, regions to go out and harvest those remnants and scale them up, for example. So there really isn't even a plan B in a lot of areas for plants that aren't protected. And they're just kind of swept out of the rug. And it's death, death by a thousand cuts. Um, so it's it's sort of this insidious, invisible, ongoing threat that I think sometimes we forget about just because, you know, they're plants, they're all weedy. They're all, mm-hmm. they're all just kind of the, the, the window shades and the carpet, you know, the backdrop to mm-hmm. our, to our lives, but really they're the foundation of our lives. Anyway. No, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I, you know, it, it made me think I, I just read a book. It's by uh, Leah Rampey called earth and soul. And she's talking about the, uh, uh, the Chinese famine when they killed all the sparrows and not realizing that they were eating the locust that was protecting <laughs> yeah they were protecting the food crops more they were taking less than the locust would after the sparrows were gone and you don't realize the value of something sometimes until it's gone unfortunately and and it seems like a it's a reoccurring theme and it's just we keep losing more and more and more so how do you protect some of those areas that are under under duress like and I'm not even sure like that for most of the land in Canada, is it mostly publicly owned? Is it – like I know for, for us, it's it's almost you know so much publicly owned. Um, I would imagine it's a similar – So uh, yeah, so Atlanta Canada in general, I'd have to grab – look at exact stats. But you know, PEI is very um, – I think about 90 percent of PEI is privately owned land, and it's mostly farmland. Okay. Um, Newfoundland might be the exact opposite where 90% of it is, uh, indigenous and, and, um, provincially managed land. Mm -hmm. Um, Nova Scotia might be about half and half, I think. And New Brunswick has a huge amount of freehold area. So it's, it's public land, but it's licensed. I don't know the, the perfect thing, uh, in terms of what the arrangement is, but there's a lot of, uh, public land leased to, um, forestry companies or to timber management Mm -hmm. groups or cooperatives. So um, New Brunswick, when I drive through it, I mean, New Brunswick, I never imagined I'd be living there um, as well. And I haven't even explored enough of it, but New Brunswick as a province is just beautiful. It probably would be quite similar to Maine and, and uh, neighbors. So it's, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of Acadian forest. And then in the North, it goes up into the, the boreal sort of. So, so yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a big wide mix and that's then it, Canada's just a patch quilt <laughs> of, of of different uh, different management regimes, different different histories of how each province is managed. I mean, Newfoundland only joined joined us in 1949, I think. Um, so you know, there's 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 a lot of different there's a lot of different arrangements that have developed over time, and again, it's probably reflected in in a lot of the history of what is is trying to be addressed now with trying to put things back the way they were or to try and prepare for the future or whatever it might be. So, and there's lots of big announcements happening. The, some of the biggest things in the last years have been, again, those there's huge swaths of land being, um, you know, ceded back to indigenous groups. I think the Northern territories just signed over, um, uh, signed over more land management rights to all the indigenous groups to none of it, I think, uh, mm. just, I heard wow. that in the news the other day. So it's, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of paradigm shifts that are happening. And, and I think, you know, again, it's, I think that the native plant discussion, biodiversity, all of those factors that kind of diffuses into things that we may not, might not consider being, um, being supportive of native plant work or, or that, but it's happening. <laughs> Now, one thing we we've, we've kind of touched around a couple times um, was the the forestry industry in Canada, and um, mm-hmm. I guess it's it's really multifaceted. Uh, and I before we start, I just had mentioned I uh, finished uh, Suzanne Samard's book, Finding the Mother Tree, and she was uh, involved with this. Um, 
I can't remember the, <laughs> the organization name, but uh, she was involved with the forestry industry from the uh, as a biologist, right from uh, with the government side of things, kind of with the regulation. And um, oh, where did my question go? But she kind of even lays it out in her book. But can you explain some of the importance of forestry in uh, in Canada and then its interaction with native plants, both maybe some of the, the positive and negatives that it has uh, interaction-wise with native plants. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm i also a big fan of Suzanne Simard's work, and yeah, she'd worked for, I, I believe she'd started her career, if I remember the book correctly, that she started her career working for the, the Ministry of Forests. So they have a huge research arm. Um, and, you know, to the BC, and to the BC economy, forestry is a huge, a huge contributor. Um, so yeah, just, just in general and the best I can do, I'm not a registered professional forester. It is a registered trade in Canada and Mm -hmm. most people to, to authorize any long-term management plans, you have to be approved by regulated boards. And and, and then there's kind of similar things in in the West for biologists and agrologists and all these things. So, um, yeah, across Canada, uh, sustainable forest management practices are, have been in place for quite a long time. So um, that would, that requires people to, you know, consult with local groups to produce plans, to think about what they're going to harvest, to know and prepare for it. So that's why there's such a strong supply chain um, management aspect because the growers for those, for seedlings, for those 500 or 600 million a year, like they kind of know what's coming uh, well in advance. And so that system has been, um, well, again, well established for a while. Um, each province is different. So, you know, uh, Ontario and Manitoba recently closed some of their, so a lot of the provinces, I'll, I'm just going to, I like history lessons. I'm a yeah. chronological <laughs> thinker. Um, a lot of, so a lot of the over enthusiasm for the endless amount of wilderness we had got sort of realized by the, like the late 1880s and the early, you know, 1920s. And, um, there were some really big things that started to happen with, with I think, just, you know, ecology fighting back. So, like, where around where Stefan lives, grew up, um, Norfolk County, there's huge sand plain areas. And, you know, I see pictures of it. And south of my house here, the Ganaraska Forest, basically, it's forested now, but it was basically a sand dune eating people's houses when mm. there was no trees left. And people said, well, I think we went a little too far. So, you know, some of the um, afforestation programs for us where we're putting – we're, we're using trees essentially as a nurse crop to just just capture the dirt from running back, back into the you know the Great Lakes and the the the, the waterways. Um, a lot of the programs that started for public native plant development. If I'm 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 going to use this term. I mentioned this before we start recording, but you know for me uh, trees are plants too because they have they they fit into the whole taxonomy mm-hmm. thing. And as a botanist. I, Hopefully the botanists that are listening can agree that like trees are plants just, just for this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so I always, you know, start putting the native plant development process on what we did for trees. Cause it was just, they were the first workhorse species that we said, we're going to put public money. We started public nurseries, started public seed centers. And most provinces um, had that um, in place to address various like ecological things that were starting to happen. Um, so really, and, and I mean, I'm familiar with Ontario, but I think in the 1940s, there was a sort of watershed movement to create conservation agencies that would manage things based on a watershed analysis approach. So that was kind of, I think that's a bit unique to Canada um, across the whole range, but it's, it's you know, at the time. Um, but people were using native plants to, to, to fix problems. So that's where I put it back at. And, um, and yeah, so... Sorry, remind me of the question. It was basically the, <laughs> I guess, the importance of forestry uh, to, yeah, of forestry. yeah, to both the Canadian economy and then, um, then how they're interacting with native plants. I guess realistically, it's a, a product. They're using some of these really old trees as the the product, and then um, what are they doing? Uh, I guess like positive and negative, how they're using native plants right. and putting okay. them back on the landscape. Yeah. So um, yeah, that, and that's where I was going with like my, chrono- my chronology. So um, I would say that through yeah through the '60s, '70s, '80s, there was a real concerted, uh, cooperative approach to try and get tree breeding programs. Whether or not like there was you know obviously a need to 
to choose the better growing trees, the faster growing trees, the disease result uh, tolerant trees. So a lot of those programs started across Canada. Um, the Canadian Forest Genetics Association that I mentioned that I work with, it used to be called the Canadian Tree Improvement Association. Way even before that, it was like Forestry Breeding Canada or something. Um, their proceedings that I help manage their website goes back to like 1937. It's all documented. It's super cool to read. I mean, no one else might read it with as much interest as I do, but I think it's really interesting just to see because it is native plant materials development. Um, and it's, you know, trees are just slower than everything else. Um, yeah. I kind of almost envy being a, you know, a, a native plant person if you're working on something with a shorter time span because <laughs> yeah. you, you kind of like get your, your feedback quicker. But um, yeah, so, you know, the, the, the positive element for us for forestry in Canada is that it's like, it's a backbone. It became this network of, you know, people needed wood and we needed, there was mills everywhere um, in a lot of rural areas. It was uh, forestry and pulp and paper for a while were, were kind of like mainstays of, of, of a whole a lot of towns. So, you know, if you wanted to go work in Northern Ontario and if you were a university kid to want to go make money and plant trees, like that was a place to go do it. And it was, it was a way of exploring kind of the North probably for a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our history. Um, and then, yeah, the afforestation programs and the nurseries that got developed, they were initially in public dollars. And then there was a slow transition through the sort of nineties and two thousands where things have become more privatized. And then, yeah, recently, um, you know, the negative side of things I think is just, you know, is it, here's here's an here's an irony. Um, the ironic part is getting so efficient at things that eventually someone says, "Well, that's not making any money anymore," or it seems like it's really low activity compared to what it was in the heyday. So let's close it because we don't need it anymore. Um, so I mean, Stefan's really well aware of this too. But but you know, it, was, it actually kind of broke my heart because uh, in 2017 we were picking like a tractor trailer load of cones, white pine cones. Wow. It was a huge bumper crop. Wow. And it got, it was going to get sent to the Ontario tree seed plant that had been operating since 1924. And, you know, we got a phone call that just said, we're, we're shutting this thing down. And we're like, what? Like the, the truck's on the way. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm never against value for money um, in any organization, whether you're private business or government. Mm -hmm. But I, I still think that that was a regrettable decision in many ways. Um, because it just left this giant gaping hole in, in, in sort of what we're trying to do. Um, and, Man and Manitoba had also made the decision to close the public nursery, but you know, there's, there's groups coming along and trying to, to backfill that. So um, it's just, it's a, you kind of just see these troughs go up and down in terms of, uh, you know, lots of support, not enough support, but a couple of years later, you know, now, now there's a whole bunch of new targets and we got to we gotta ramp up again. So, um, yeah, I think uh, when you were mentioning about the forest industry getting involved in native plants, I'm going to say they already are. <laughs> They're busy. Anybody I know who is in, uh, you know, growers are about as as rare a commodity as a new gold mine these mm. days. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, uh, my dad would love me to come back and go back to the growing sector. And maybe I'll do that at some point. But, you know, I think that uh, that forestry is doing a good job with what they have to do with the little um, people, not to say little people, the few people and few experts that are in the system right now. And, mm -hmm. and, and that, that part, you know, everyone's busy. Um, and I think just, there's no, we don't have a lot of the, uh, there's not a lot of post-secondary education derived mm -hmm. towards plant production anymore. It seems to be something that's moved towards technical schools or it's like you learn on the job or, go, you know, go learn from the guy that's about to retire kind of thing. Um, so I think there's a real need to, to step up and just even expose more people to it um, so that we can, we can just keep letting it, like, let it get fat. <laughs> like I want to, there's, I always say too, there's, there's enough pie for everyone here. If you're interested in this stuff, yeah. business wise or, or just volunteering or whatever, there is so much that people can jump in and do. It's, it's, a smorgasbord. <laughs> Stefan, do you hey. want to add anything to that? Sure. Um, I guess I'll jump in and just uh, maybe follow or follow Melissa in her chronological story uh, structure. So the Canada's first forestry station is now Canada's largest native plant producer. Um, established in 1908 in St. Williams, Ontario. 
um, because the region turned into a dust bowl, much like the Pine Barrens, I guess, where you're calling from, um, Norfolk County is a sand barren and full of rare plants. And um, all those trees were cut down for, you know, for forestry and the, the whole landscape turned into a desert, as Melissa described. Um, but decades later, that facility is now um, Canada's largest native seed producer, filling a, a different need. Mm. Um, for native plants. But I should also maybe point to, I guess, some of the pitfalls, I will say, that uh, I can recognize within the forestry sector and within um, kind of restoration that counts on tree planting and afforestation only. One is that the element of time is often not accounted for. So so tree planting and afforestation is used um, as a means of capturing carbon. You know, we have all kinds of policies and funding streams for carbon capture in, in forestry, but um, it takes, you know, 150 years for those trees to actually, uh, you know, accumulate that much carbon. So um, the it's the element of time that can't really be replaced, and I think we're counting too much on trees in, in that case. Also, there's some situations where trees may be planted where non-trees may be more appropriate um, just because whether it's government or organizations using government funding, they're trying to achieve these targets, numbers of stems in the ground or area reforested. Uh, but in some cases, these you know landscapes might be more appropriately used for grassland nesting bird habitat or reintroduction of rare orchids or something like that. Um, and I would say also, in most reforestation movements, the understory or even shrub layer are completely ignored, and the diversity of our, diversity of our forests are not truly being restored. Um, I know timber production has a different focus, and there's economic focal species, um, but we can't really call that reforestation, in my opinion, um, be, because you know all, all the other things are not being restored um that's maybe a little bit of an or- unorganized response to your question but those are my thoughts <laughs> no i like that yeah. it made me think of too a- another question and again i know f- especially for us it varies like our our forest health where we're at is very poor because of deer pressure um because there is no understory it's been eaten away so the diversity has gone but uh you know tom mentions as as a kid being able to hear Bob White quail, and I don't, I don't even know the last time. When was the last time? Well, you saw they're, one? yeah, they're basically extirpated from the state of it, New Jersey. Yeah, so you know, but back in the seventies, it was ten deer per per acre per square mile. Per square mile, per, yeah. ten deer per square mile, and now it's two hundred and fifty deer per square mile. So it's you know a lot of the understory we remember is is gone, and that pressure's not get even with hunting, it's not getting any better because the whole ecosystem's out of whack. I, does that play a factor in in some of the forest health with understory missing? I I don't know if it's a similar situation for you with with something like that. Certainly, in and around the urban and suburban areas, where you know, and I'm calling from Niagara Niagara region in Ontario, and we have less than five percent natural cover. So every little bit of green space is chock full of deer, mm-hmm. and they're consuming the understory. Um, and, you know, there's people that are protesting the deer hunt because they're, you know, the conservation organizations try to keep these populations under control. Um, but the things that we're losing are, are plants. You know, it's the plant diversity that disappears first. Definitely in, in the more populated areas, the deer here are tame. They will walk into your backyard. They'll eat out of your garbage can. I mean, um, they're like squirrels, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we even at a at an industry conference last week, we had the whole conversation that some of the plants that are now we consider highly invasive that have been here for a while weren't invasive when deer populations were under control because invasives love disturbance. So, you know, things we go back into the seventies and we think of burning bush and, and barberry, which had been here but not a problem. We're like, how much of that was provoked or accelerated because of the deer issue? And I don't know. It's 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 all those things, and I'm sure it plays a factor in there somewhere. But it's you know as that as that goes, then invasives become an issue, and it it just becomes like a uh, an uphill struggle from there. 
I just want to add, it's almost a trifecta of, of invasion in some of these urban areas. You have deer, buckthorn, and earthworms. Um, mm-hmm. And the three of them together change the soil chemistry, they change the soil texture, and it's like a, an alternative stable state. You know, we're, ne- we're, ha- we're probably never going to get a native ecosystem back into those areas um, until an asteroid falls on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and even then, buckthorn will survive. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, I, I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm going to ignore my per- current job and just put some old hat on. I was just going to say, like, the one thing I am terrified of, and it's, I mean, I'm terrified of two things when I come back to my farms, because, like, I grew up playing in the woods here, and I'm like, I have a very visual memory of, of how beautiful the understory is. And my brother, um, my brother has a beautiful chunk of farm that he bought, and the, the woods are one of those rare spots around us at least where they didn't there was a very strong thing around my uh my area where people let cattle in the woods all the time and i mean it's Mm. probably got the same effect but you know there's a spot my um actually shouldn't say this exactly there's there's a particular (laughs) place that i know um it has like you know it's 10 it's 10 square acres of just ramps like wild allium and it's so beautiful and the claytonias and the trilliums and the ferns and you know it's just it's it's as close to things that I feel that I can still go walk into and see like, you know, this is probably close to what it was like around before there was a lot of, uh, I'm sh- it's probably changed, but I'm terrified of dog strangling vine and earthworms getting there because those things will just slowly get, yeah, like the fan said, death by a thousand cuts. And it's, it's things that, you know, the jumping worms, I think were discovered by master gardeners in, in Ontario and they're getting transported around in potting soil and, and I know that growers, I know that commercial growers, um, you know, they have to worry about a lot of things these days. Mm-hmm. But, you know, hitchhiking issues on plant production and, and how, you know, the border might inspect like 2% of the shipments that go back and forth. And people are sending seeds in the mail to every postal code you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like those are the things that it, you just don't know. And I think maybe going back to something the fans said about land use planning, you know, like... I wish we had more, I just wish we had more people with uh, the ability to intercept things that have the unknown consequences like that. Uh, We just don't have enough people that have botany backgrounds or have forest health backgrounds or pathogen backgrounds. Um, You know, mycology is still a massively understudied field as as good as Suzanne Samard's book is. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we still don't know enough about how that, what we need to put back with the things we want to put back that yeah. we also can't get. So I don't know, those, those things kind of just freak me out because I don't know what, uh, you know, you know, like, I don't know what 28 or 2080 is going to be like right now and what to work on, you know, being an ecologist from that scent, I think there's a San County Almanac um, quote that's, or something that flies around the internet and memes that basically says, you know, becoming an educated ecologist is, is, is a bit sad sometimes because you have to learn what you can't save. Stay tuned for more of the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. But it's um, like being an ecologist is living in a world of wounds, and it's like you just see all these things that are are just hurtful in a way and um and just a few years earlier you didn't even know that was a problem and but uh yeah it is pretty tough it was i do want to get into the the earthworms a little bit more um but and again this is another aside this is my like add brain working here (laughs) um and just like that it's also gone (laughs) You you said something about um, seeds going in the mail all over the place. And one of the challenges that we often have, especially with conventional horticulture, is people asking, oh, well, what is, what is native anyway? Like, what does it mean to be a native plant? And plant oh, plants we brought over, well, they're going to become native. And um, But that was a, a good, to me, was a good analogy. Because uh, what I always say is, well, it, we tend to consider pre-colonization is that time frame. And they're like, well, people would still move plants around. You had native or indigenous people were moving plants around. I'm like, yeah, that's true, but it would take a long time for those plants to go from place to place. And uh, I I don't know if it happened in 
kind of too, if you heard about this, but there was all these um, unmarked like Chinese envelopes that were showing up in the U S and people were like planting the seed with seeds in them. People were just planting the seeds. And, um, but that's like a really good illustration of how some of these invasive plants can spread so fast is, uh, oh, we- or just how, why that native plant argument can come about. It's like, you have seeds that can make it from China to the U.S. in a few days now, where previously that took thousands of years or tens of thousands of years to happen. So, and it's some of our yeah. some of the methods that are used to control it. Like we just don't, as humans, don't have a good understanding of of nature and ecology. Yeah. I think of like um, the story of the the white bark pine mm-hmm. uh, ripping out all the the currents. Yeah, thinking they held, you know, that they were gonna. I can't. Was it a rust? They're like, oh, yeah, it's the only I, host. We'll get rid of the currents. Well, it wasn't. So they got rid of all the native plants, but there were plenty of other hosts, you know. Or you know, for us with the invasion of spotted lanternfly, you know, obviously tree of heaven's the first thing. It's our natural host. Let's get rid of it. But once that's gone, there's other hosts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they they just go towards the vineyards and all these other things that they're like, oh, we didn't know they would attack that. So it's. We always have the best intentions, but yeah. but well, not necessarily the best answers. <laughs> now you, I'll, 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 oh, go you I'll, go I'll, first, I'll, and then uh, also just say something funny about the vineyard thing, only because I'm like, well, Canada also revises its safe drinking line, so that's you know maybe we can balance that out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I still don't want spotted lanterns fly anywhere near us. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So yeah, you, accepting that it's coming and trying to prepare for it. And, yeah, yeah. You'd both mentioned earthworms. As a as a something that's really a potential threat, can you go more in depth on on why that is? Because I know a lot of people who are just getting into native plants, and especially the, one of the things that tends to align with it is composting, and then worms go with composting. So I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear earthworms not being a good thing for native plants. Can you go a little more in depth on that? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm no, by no means a worm expert, but I am friends with some worm experts. Um, so my understanding is it's twofold. One, um, non-native earthworms have very shallow and specifically shaped burrows. And while this seems like it's good for aerating the soil, it's, it's actually um, supporting a whole microbiome that denitrifies the soil. Hmm. So it supports a bunch of bacteria, and and I don't know the specific organisms, but they essentially increase the amount of nitrogen that's lost to the atmosphere from the Mm -hmm. soil. So that's number one. That's why they're bad in at least productive like agricultural systems. Um, Number two is that they consume underground plant parts Mm -hmm. um, uh, and create kind of easier access for other organisms to consume plants. Parts yeah. Of underground. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Very cool. I, I didn't know if I knew that. Yeah. So I, I, and that's not just jumping worms. That's, uh, that's other earthworms as well. Right. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's huge. I mean, again, I'm also going to state before I talk is that I'm not a worm expert and I don't have as many worm expert friends as Sam <laughs> does apparently. So, um, I'm going to hang out at those parties though. Um, yeah, the, the the things that I understand from reading a bit a bit about it, and actually Frank Gilman, if you ever listen to this, um, is a really fan. He's got some really fantastic books that I, if I was ever working again in, in herbaceous and woodland plants and woodland ephemerals, are like my favorite thing to grow, and that's why you know I, I take an interest in the earthworm issue. But you know, the other thing that's um, <laughs> I'll say that uh, natural resource development in Canada, this is a two part answer, is that you know earthworms are probably strangely linked with uh, forestry, fishing, and hunting because we yeah. take bait everywhere, and it. Uh, Stefan's comment about the nitrogen is, you know, it's, it, and maybe a lot of people that haven't been up to Canada don't know this, but I mean, they're very, you know, where where you see Canadian cities in the Google Maps uh, saying, or you look on where land clearing has happened, that's in really tends to be more calcium rich. Um, you know, the the richest farmland and, and class class A farmland is all in those areas. But once you're up into the boreal and where forestry becomes um, you know, a big part of the economy is that it tends to be a non-agricultural thin soils. So there's not much soil and it's really low in nitrogen. So the plants that are there really need it. So the issue with earthworms, as far as I've heard it from anglers and hunters and people that work in boreal ecosystems or acidic, you know, acidic 
places are that, you know, if you get earthworms invading those areas, they are taking and robbing very precious nutrients for plant growth and, and that. So that's another issue. And again, it's a bit of a geospatial one because we don't want them yeah. where they don't belong anyways, but we really don't want them in places where they're, they're um, going to impact things like that. But it gets, you know, if anyone's listening, they come to Canada, do not throw your earthworm or fishing bait out into <laughs> yeah. wherever you think they need to go. So, oh, yeah. yeah that's a big yeah. part of it. We talked about that with somebody else years ago now. I can't but, remember. Uh, but I remember one of my big takeaways was it's some of the marketing on uh, earthworms for fishing is like Canadian night crawlers. And it's like, you look them up, not actually native to Canada. <laughs> but, yeah. So, Just because as, something has canadensis in the, in, yeah. the, in, the, in the name. Don't remember those? those were, so those Latin names sometimes were added when uh, people didn't have great mapping skills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the things, um, as we're getting a little bit closer to when we want to wrap up here, that I did want to touch on is how both of you are doing some incredible things about – helping native plant communities in your respective areas. Uh, Stefan, I'd like to start with you on what you're doing to help native plants in, in your neck of the woods. Sure. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm currently working with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and we're working on a framework for a national native seed strategy. So we hope that this will help improve the supply of native plants and seeds for restoration across Canada, and that will benefit native plant communities. Um, but we're also doing quite a bit of habitat restoration on the ground in southern Ontario, mostly related to, we'll call them prairie meadow habitats to support pollinators, including the monarch butterfly, which was just listed as endangered in Canada um, just maybe a week ago or maybe a couple of weeks ago. Um, so a lot of our work focuses on uh, partnering with rights of way managers, so these are utility corridor managers, municipal, you know, land planners, in order to increase the amount of habitat for monarch butterfly in and around cities, which basically is all of southern Ontario is one big urban sprawl city. Um, so making the most out of those green spaces, connecting those habitats, and then working with the native plant growers in this region on which plants to grow. So taking some of the guesswork out of monarch butterfly habitat creation, uh, we're focusing on a, uh, it's a pile of 45 different species that are beneficial to the monarch during its flight period um, and are also easy to produce in bulk format, you know, clean, store, that kind of thing. Um, so we're working in some pretty rare habitats as well. I'm very pleased to have joined two uh, recovery strategy working groups, one for the bird's foot uh, violet and uh, one for the Virginia goat's root, which are two endangered plants in southern Ontario that only have basically one population oh, wow. in the same place, um, a, a sand barren kind of region. So that's pretty interesting. It's not exactly broad scale seed based restoration, but it is really cool plant conservation work that I'm thrilled to be a part of yeah that's, that's fantastic yeah. work that's awesome and um and for those of you who want to uh look up the canadian wildlife federation one of the things i found really interesting is they're on their header slides one of the first things that comes up is uh how to connect with nature when it's below zero so gives you a little <laughs> bit of input of what the temperature might be up there um and melissa how about how about you oh geez yeah it's, it's yeah, I, I'm not sure if it was recorded. I was laughing because I'm like, this just feels very much like the uh, the Olympics of, of, of native plants <laughs> together. Um, well, and, and again, I don't want to take credit for, for us being the first or whatever uh, groups that are doing things to help. Again, I think there's so many people that have come before us. I mean, I've been mentored by some phenomenal people um, that have probably done, you know, probably committed their entire lives to helping get this stuff off the ground. I think there's a lot of people to sank long before us um so we always stand on the shoulders of giants as we say um especially in forestry but um what i'm doing right now that i'm pretty proud of i mean i one of the things that uh i'm i picked up years ago and it was actually it was right before i think the uh when i went down to washington um there was a group there was a group um that was formed back in like 1983 and they do, it's a tree seed working group, and it's just kind of been an informal ad hoc thing, and it publishes a little newsletter, but to me, it, when I discovered it, and it's kind of like, you know, when you go, I find it, 
it had the same effect on me as like the the ringer site um mm-hmm. you know where all the seed manuals are and all the free resources and you're like holy geez this is free this is a this is like the you know the encyclopedia of what's happened um especially with tree seed in Canada. So when I was really interested in getting into seed banking, you know, there's not many places to go work at a seed bank in Canada. So I kind of got that in my head around 2013. I was like, I'm going to do that. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? Uh, you know, went to Q, learned from them, came back here and so just, just said, you know, what can I do? So, you know, it, it sounds small, but to me, again, because the, because the people that are really concerned with native plant stuff in Canada is pretty small. Uh, my big thing, I came from marketing. I actually used to work for Mercedes Benz Canada and sell cars. And then I was like, no, I'm going to convert, convert my energy into something good for the planet. Um, so just taking over that news bulletin, it connects about right now we have almost six or 700 people that get the newsletter. I do it, you know, it's kind of through work time, but I, I get a whole bunch of different people across Canada to weigh in on what's happening. And, and it's just a free newsletter that we put out. And, you know, it's just, it's such an active, interesting group. And then we get together every two years um, for a big conference, kind of similar to the National Native Seed Strategy. So it's really forestry and forest genetics. But, um, you know, to me, being involved in that and being a young person stepping up into the the whiz and gray hair crowd, at times you're looked at a bit of a side eye. They're like, are you sure you want to be here? I'm like, yes, I do. Um, So I don't know. I guess how I help is that I just, I constantly to my own demise or not, um, volunteer for things because, um, you know, I think that I want to put the skills I have to use. I want to put the, you know, the, the farm energy, like I grew up on a farm and my dad's a workaholic and I'm a workaholic. So, um, you know, I want to put that energy into good things. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people right now that are retiring. There's been a massive retirement, um, wave that happened. It was starting before COVID and it just accelerated. So I just try to, keep things going that are already going because I don't see the point in reinventing the wheel all the time. Um, but yeah, I, I, at my seed bank, I'm really enthusiastic about, you know, actually Tom, you mentioned the words and it's kind of my, my boss's slang uh, for, for our seed bank. We are the backup plan. Yeah. So we're constantly doing outreach and saying to local conservation groups, like do 90% of your work, but send us 10% of your extra or, you know, just put some mm-hmm. away just in case something happens. And so, you know, again, that, that carrot versus stick thing in Canada, which is like, we will, you know, my seed bank offers seed banking services for trees and shrubs right now, but I'm really happy that the, that I'm supporting the indigenous seed collection program. So it's indigenous led. We are having MOUs with communities um, starting. So they decide the plants of interest they want to work on. They want us to help with, they want us to test, they want us to research. And I love doing research for people. Um, that don't have time to do it. So I'm like, you're busy doing what you got to do, monitoring bats and worms and fish and all those things. I'm like, oh, you, you've got a plant list? Send it to me. I'll, I'll read up on it. We'll figure if we can bank it or not. Um, we have cryopreservation mm-hmm. at our facility as well, which I'm really excited to have just as a tool because there's some species you can't bank and growers think can't be saved for a long time. Um, and I'm constantly just, uh, I'm always diving into our database. And actually one thing that I am, that I think is useful to people and to growers. And when I was working for my parents' nursery and just trying to, you know, work out the code, how to break a really difficult species germination, like an anemone canadensis still like thwarts me all the time. Um, you know, it just decides it has different dormancy patterns every spring. I'm like, you're annoying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, like um, the one thing I really love about our seed bank and being a, you know, it's kind of a working facility. We've been along with R and D for so many programs so many different researchers, so many different interests. Like we have data on over 400 species um, that we've tested for sometimes decades at a time. The oldest seedlot, um, the oldest native seedlot we have is Jack Pine from 1951. We've been testing it every year. Um, But we have a lot of seed bank that a lot of people don't think can be stored, like willows and poplars. We have 44-year-old poplar seeds still germinating above 50%. Um, So, you know, reinforcing things I learned in England and using them every day and showing growers like, like you don't need a lot of technology to save seeds. Like seed saving is as old as, as human history. Um, and, and then, you know, indigenous people are getting so much more um, uh, vocal about their knowledge of it and how local, how local plants. Uh, the one thing that my boss constantly reminds me of, and I love it is that, and I'm glad to even repeat this on a podcast is just, you know, he always says, he did a big cross country road trip um, to kind of launch our program and met with people where they're at. 
and learn from them and walk in their shoes. And I love walking and hanging out with um, meeting community members and just walking around their, their lands with them and seeing what they see. But, you know, like you never need to explain the importance of local ecotypes to indigenous people, because to them, those are their relatives. It's like having your cousins nearby. And Mm -hmm. that, that started to sink in with me a lot lately. And I really, I really, I'm so enthusiastic about um, learning with uh, learning from those people and hearing more about what, what it means to them. So every time we have an indigenous training session or I go uh, to one of their communities and meet with them, like it's funny and I don't know what it, it, I have an emotional reaction all the time and it did get spawned with a lot of the, you know, the graves that were discovered here, but it's like, they're so connected to that stuff. It's, it's, it is their relatives. It's their family. So I get, I get very emotional about seeing like, you know, um, people's names on jars of seeds in my seed bank. Mm-hmm. I'm like, some of them aren't alive anymore. Some yeah. of them, their grandkids might get in touch with me and I want to give it back to them or something. So, No, uh, I, I, I've been reading more and more about that myself and it's definitely something trying to even do little practices to become a little closer with, with nature, um, just little things just to, to view it differently because that's the only way things are going to change in my opinion. So, Stefan – before we ask the last question, I know Melissa kind of went into like a little bit of her background and kind of how she got where she got. What what guided you to take the path that you did to do what you do today? Sure. Well, I guess I've always been a plant nut. Um, I went to school for horticulture. I've always been a gardener. Um, plant taxonomy and evolution has always been fascinating for me. My first foray into native plants, I guess, was – through an internship at a herbarium. So I spent a, a summer taking native plant samples from across southwestern Ontario and l- learning the diversity of our lo- local flora that way. Um, and then when I finished my master's, I got a job with Canada's largest native plant producer and spent about eight years there learning all kinds about you know restoration practice, but also what was holding practitioners back Mm -hmm. from achieving some of their goals and targets. Uh, Some of the kind of challenges in terms of the scientific literature. So I decided to go back and do a PhD. Um, I got funding through the Ministry of Transportation to study the role of roadside restoration and invasive plant control in infrastructure corridors. Um, And that really kind of sealed the deal for me. Um, you know, not only am I in love with these plants, but I think that there's the solution to so many of our problems. And, um, I'm, you know, I'm dedicated for life now. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. I love oh, that. Yeah. All right. For the sake of time, I think we're at that point in the show where we ask our last question, which is always the same and always the simplest yet the hardest. So I'll throw it out there. Whoever wants to go first can. But the question is, what is your favorite native plant? <laughs> um, I guess you were chosen to go first. <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. I'm going to start with a family of plants. Okay. I'm going to start with the 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 legumes, the <laughs> fabaceae. Um, so in particular, there's uh, wood vetch, Carolina wood vetch, very rare in Ontario. The only population I know in my home county has fewer than 20 individuals that ever reproduce, um, and they're just. To me, they're inspiring because they exist on this very precarious piece of private land. There's nothing working for them. Everything is working against them, and yet they're still there. You know, there's invasive plants all around them, um, climate change, all that, and yet they are still there. And they're the most gorgeous little plants. If you you know, if you're familiar with um, milk or with vetches, yeah, they they can be weedy, but this little plant is just the most delicate gorgeous colored spring flower um i don't know i'm in love i don't think anyone's it's, mentioned that no one has mentioned that and i'm looking at some pictures right now that, and uh yeah the fan story cool. kind of reminded me of kyle liebarger from the native native habitat project who who tells the stories where he'll see something on private property and knock on the door and say this is what you have it's pretty special can i just manage this you don't have to pay me <laughs> like i just want to make sure this doesn't go away mm-hmm. And it's 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 pretty amazing some of the things he's been able to 
he's gotten schools to buy, purchase land, things like that, to make outdoor classrooms, to keep some of these things. So it's I love that passion. I, I appreciate that. But, Melissa, you do now have to answer the question. It is your turn. Uh, <laughs> honestly, it was funny because I looked over the questions. I'm like, okay, Stefan can help me with this, 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 this. And I get down to the bottom like, oh, this one is a doozy. <laughs> um, it can be what's your favorite native plant today. <laughs> well, uh, I've been given this one. This one's been my, I'd say my favorite since, since uh, actually, since Stefan is a big part of this, so. Um, my favorite that I'm going to state today and has been for a bit is, uh, the Magnolia cuminata. So cucumber Magnolia, it's not rare in the U S it was what I call Canada's, uh, Canada's first panda of tree conservation, because it was the kind of, I think, I think it was the first tree that was recommended as endangered long before we had a federal species at risk act. Um, and long before Ontario also had one. So all the populations are in Southern Ontario. Um, me growing up around Peterborough, I grew up in sort of the mixed wood Acadian type forest, you know, New Hampshire and New York state kind of thing. So lots of maples and beech and hemlocks and, and balsam fir and whatnot. But when I got to go study, uh, down in Niagara parks, I mean, you know, you suddenly get exposed to all the, all the Carolinian flora. And I think that's probably where Stefan and I met. We started botanizing with all of our tr- plant nerd friends, um, the most. So uh, and that was kind of where I got enthusiastic about seed banking. And then, of course, it snowballs. And years later, you learn about, oh, you can't bank a lot of stuff. And, and for the longest time, people said uh, cucumber tree, you couldn't bank. And um, in 2019, we had a massive bumper crop. And uh, the one, he actually knew my dad really well. Maybe some people know the book. But Henry Koch um, had established a rare woody plant program at the University of Guelph. And he has a really great book. But he'd been collecting and recognizing plants were rare long before um, you know, anyone, again, probably sounds like that fellow you're just mentioning. So mm-hmm. he'd, he'd gone around and collected, um, a few seeds from a bunch of the disjunct populations in Ontario. There's a really, uh, good, um, they call it an archive, but it's basically a, a progeny orchard, seed orchard, a uh, little planting of a whole, I think it's eight different populations. They're rep- eight different families are represented there. So it's a, yeah, it's a, they had a, huge seed crop in 2019. So just for an example, for a training class um, for the certified seed collector course that I was helping teach at the time, um, we collected a bunch and kept them all separate by parent tree and shipped them to the tree seed bank. And then it was just funny because I, you know, I kind of went off uh, contract with that job and then I switched and went to the seed bank. So I both, I both collected them on one side of the fence and then was on the receiving end. And uh, yeah, the, the amazing thing to me was, was saying, well, geez, we've got a, this massive seed collection, and our seed bank had never had a successful germination of any of these. So I'm like, well, they must have just, you know, it, it, it happens. You're, you you try a bunch of things, they never live. But um, it was one of those things that I discovered by happenstance and circumstance and just good luck inside of the desk, like working till 6 p.m. at night, that I did some tetrazoleum testing, and I found out that the food around the and uh, around the seed, the endosperm, couldn't tolerate being desiccated but the embryo would be alive so i have this fantastic photo and and i think i shocked a few people at magnolia society and um uh kevin Parrish, i think down at at south carolina state university was like how did you do this and i was like i don't know it's tetrazoleum it tells me if it's alive or not yeah but um we managed to we were we were doing it in parallel to a chinese group that was also working on an endangered magnolia so we both at the same time discovered that we could put them in cryogenic storage and then recover them on on uh, micro tissue wow. culture. So wow. um, I was so, I don't, people hear me squeal in the hallways all the time at work. I'm like, what's most excited about now? Um, I was so excited when we, you know, it's the first ever evidence of being able to recover this species, um, you know, ex situ. And a bunch of those got planted back um, on some federal lands uh, last summer. And I've literally driven these babies back and forth like three times. And I'm just like, again, I'm in love with them. I just think that they're they're a small little contribution that I've done, and uh, that one picture just it kind of sent a few waves around. So I, I would really love it to be. I'm working on my master's as well, but I'm trying to publish. Still trying to get that published, but it's just been so busy, and I'm not a superstar researcher like Stefan is. So <laughs> yeah. I'm Those, learning science late in life. <laughs> Those are some of the best stories attached oh, to yeah. favorite. We've had a, a few. They're right up there. I don't want to discount all of them, but those are right up. Yeah, I'd say top five. Definitely. Um, so this is the point of the show. We always end with final thoughts, and and Tom and I will even take a turn in this as well. 
And this is where we we hand the floor over to each of you, uh, and you get to use the time however you want. If you want to promote something, if you want to mention something that we didn't talk about, if you want to, uh, you can use it however you want. If it, you know, it's however you want to take the time. Uh, you're more than you know. If you want to summarize, however, but let's start with uh, Stefan. If you wanna, you wanna do final thoughts. Um, sure. So, <laughs> uh, final thoughts for me. Um, I think it would be very important for Canadians to get political about native plants, to speak to their local representatives about why native plants matter to them. Uh, whether you have a business that's, you know, revolving around native plants, whether you are concerned about the loss of bees and pollinators, I think if you can make a personal connection in your own life to native plants and then communicate how that how important that is to you and to your political representatives, um, I think that will make the difference because what we're hearing from the political sphere is that nobody, nobody is talking about this. So, you know, the biologists and the, and the, you know, seed people in the room are where the native plants are important, but politicians don't get the message from their voters that native plants are important to them. They might get the message that bees are important or maybe wolves or whales are important, but they almost never get the message that native plants are important. So if there's one thing you can do this year, even if you don't have a garden, um, Talk talk to your political representatives about why this matters to you. Man, that's a great point. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Melissa, how about no pressure now? Melissa, <laughs> how's how about you for a final thought? <laughs> uh no, I'm I'm glad for that. I'm gonna go on a slightly different tangent. Um yeah, so um last summer I had been presenting at a, a forestry conference it's on YouTube. I can share it with you guys if you want to add it to some links. But awesome. yes. um, one of the things that I did at this workshop, it was just a quick summary, but you know, I, I mentioned that wave of retirement we've had and my dad, and I'm going to just put him on the spot for this because my dad always goes, you know, he'll be like, I don't need to write down it's in the mainframe. And I'm like, yeah, I know dad, but you're a brilliant guy who spent 40 or 50 years accumulating such amazing information or knowledge about, what you do. And, you know, my dad was kind of growing um, some native plants before it was the cool thing. So my point that I'd like to leave folks with is that, you know, if you're in the wizened gray hair about to retire or don't want to retire just yet um, age group, and you've been working with native plants for decades, please write it down. Please record mm -hmm. a podcast like this so that <laughs> some people can hear it and people can find it. Cause a lot of people go to their graves with that, it just spawns reinventing the wheel constantly. And I, I appreciate it because for a while I was the young kid not knowing that I was talking about things that people were had already tried to solve a long time ago. And maybe it wasn't the time, but I'm like, the more people that get it written down, that get it infused in, in, in something that gets handed down to the next generation in the way that people just in this day and age need to learn things and hear things. Sometimes it's just a social media meme um, that hits somebody over the head and they go, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's good or that's good information. Um, I think I think people people just need to pass on their knowledge a little bit more. And the second thing I'll advocate for is that it feeds perfectly into this, is that if you're a, an expert in native plants and you want to retire and do something easy, please get into mentorship or please think about in Canada. I'm very much in the in the realm of thinking now that the way to shore up our labor shortages, our our workforce shortages is like we need a red seal for native plant and seed production. Um, it, you know, we have one for agricultural equipment operators and when a, someone gets a red seal trade certificate in Canada, they can move to almost any province and get a job and it's well paid and it's, you know, it's well recognized. I, we have it for horticulture, but we have nothing really for reforestation nursery staff and for, mm -hmm. for horticultural nursery staff to learn native plant production. It is harder than typical ornamental horticulture. So I, I feel like we need to build up that program and train a whole new army. You guys have you guys have cone cores and climate corps down there, and we kind of need that too. Yeah, great thought. Your yeah. your father must have been a propagator because they don't they don't like to share a lot of those secrets. <laughs> yeah. It's their livelihood. <laughs> I, I know I know people that are that are propagators that are all great friends, but just won't share that knowledge because that's 
that's what they figured out and that's that's what they do well and it's hard hard to let that go until they're ready and then they're they're a good mentor <laughs> my dad my dad is in the in the category of I'll share knowledge if you will walk with me while I water or you have to call me and it has to be a good day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Tom, do you want to go or you want me to? Yeah. Go? I, I really want to just thank both of you for coming on because, um, and you both, your final thoughts were some of the best. I think I, I remember I agree, hearing, yeah. get involved politically, advocate for native plants. And, uh, if you don't know much about native plants, reach out to those who do and pick their brains. And, uh, even if they tell you no a couple of times, Keep bugging Fran. Keep asking for, <laughs> for advice. And then if you're on the other end, you know something, look for people to share that information with because it really does go a long way um, for the planet. So, yeah, and uh, and the, I've, I've been thinking the last couple of days as if we've had more of these international calls, yeah. how I keep screwing up. I feel real, really feel dumb when I can't do the, like, Fahrenheit, the Celsius conversions in my head and uh, – and I'm like, oh, man, and I really need to be better at this. It makes me think. If you haven't yeah. seen it, watch the Nate Bargatze uh, skit on Saturday Night Live, George Washington and his, his dreams yeah. of America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. what it's all about, yeah. weights and measures. Um, so mine is, you know, and, and we're, we have a tendency, like not always on the podcast, but we, we do what we know and what's local to us because it's what we know. But conservation is a worldwide effort. Mm -hmm. it, it takes more than just us and our little area, and there's nothing wrong with focusing on your area. Um, but it's always great to get a view of the big picture, which I think we did today, and I really appreciate. Um, and that – you know – Sparked by something Melissa said, consider your own place in nature. Like it, it does take a little bit of that deeper connection. And we're talking to two people that you can tell have that deeper connection and that helps to, to find our way and, and to make good decisions and, and to help. And, and that's going to take a lot of practice because we don't know. We've lost touch with that over time. Mm -hmm. So um, – you know, it's I, I can't thank the two of you enough for, for being a part of this and just giving a, a better picture of you know, for as many for as much as some things are the same, some things are different, but it's all part of the goal. And and I can't thank you enough. Yeah. For that. Yeah. So that's gonna wrap us up for today. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed listening to uh, our two Canadian guests. And uh, one of the things I failed to do before this is get uh, links for where people can find out more about you guys and then what you're working on. Uh, I think people are really going to be interested in that um, Canadian seed strategy. So if you want to drop either social media stuff here right now, you can say it, or you can uh, you can shoot it to us and we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, I definitely want to put them in the show notes as well. So, um, yeah, so thank you everyone for listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pilots Nursery. Big thank you to the Egocentric Plastic Men for contributing our theme music. Make sure you stream or buy their songs wherever you consume music. Thank you to Dave Bennett for our Native Plant Anthem. Follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Native Plants underscore Healthy Planet, and also YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. Don't forget about the question and comment line. You can call us at 215-346-6189. I will repeat that. 215-346-6189. We're coming up on episode 200. If you want to call in and tell us how much you love us, we'll, well, we can deal with that. We, you know, we don't encourage that, but if it happens, you know, we'll <laughs> mention it online. Uh, but if you leave a, uh, ask a question or leave a comment, we'll do our best to answer it on a future episode of The Buzz. Thank you to all the wonderful new members of the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group and for the kind and generous community. Uh, we have yeah that. yeah you can buy native plants healthy planet merch on our website www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com we don't keep any of the profits from that we basically pull them and then once we get enough money in there to donate we donate it to uh someone that or an organization we feel is doing really good boots on the ground work that a couple hundred dollars will make a big difference to so um if you want to look stylish go buy yourself a native plants healthy planet t-shirt and if you haven't already hit subscribe on our podcast and leave us a five-star review those go a long way in helping us. And uh, and if you do a little write-up with that five-star review, I give you a shout-out on our Buzz episodes. So with that, thank you, everyone. I'm Tom. And I am Fran. Thank you again, everyone. Melissa and Stefan, thank you both so much. Uh, coming up next week, it will either be episode 200 or episode 202. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, make sure you tune in, and until then, keep it native. Woods, wetlands, and dales grows a bounty of beauty that never fails. Our native plants.
is so diverse and so rare Treasures of our land beyond compare For the friends below, soaring oaks above These clan has a place, each bit is love Modern caterpillars, marsh milk, wheat so tall These buzz about, sipping nuts and small Oh native class, how do you grace this land? In your diversity, we will take a stand To bring songs to preserve our generations of calm and beauty Second to none to protect and preserve the earth to restore the native plant food that you just can't ignore. Golden god, aster, and flowers galore. Menard is so stunning, can't help but adore. Your colors, the fragrance, a place for the eye. Your value to wild like no need to disguise. Native plants, how you grace this land. In your diversity, we will take a stand. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.